Our next speaker is Jeff Lindsay. Uh, Jeff Lindsay and his wife Kendra are residents, well, they were residents of Shanghai, China. Uh, what's that, still are? Okay, residents of Shanghai, China. So, did anybody come from further away to go to the fair conference than Jeff? <laughs> By the way, my son lives in Hong Kong. We ought to get you two together. Um, Jeff has been providing online materials defending the LDS faith for over 20 years, primarily at jefflindsay.com, and he has a Mormonity blog. It's been in operation since 2004. So, with that short introduction, I'll turn the time over to Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. It's a true delight to be here. It's a great pleasure to be here and also a great terror. There's a Chinese saying known as a cheng yu that goes ban man nong fu. That means playing tricks, doing axe tricks in front of the gate of Mr. Ban, who is the master of the axe, trying to show off in front of the true experts. And uh, it feels that way to be here, talking in front of people whose books I've read, whose articles I've read, who've been an inspiration in defending the faith and teaching the faith and helping to highlight the wonders of the LDS scriptures and the restoration for so many years. And I hope the, the, the comments I make today might make some additional insight or contribution to some of that work, but I am just amazed at how much uh, knowledge is standing here before me. And it's a great terror to be here in front of you, so thank you. Um, my topic today is on the theme of Arise from the Dust, which I see as a very rich theme in the Book of Mormon and, and the Scriptures. And to help introduce this, I've chosen a scene from an LDS video at LDS.org. This is Mary standing in front of the empty tomb, puzzling as she beholds evidence for one of the greatest, the greatest miracle of all time. Behind her is the gardener, who is actually the Lord Jesus Christ freshly arisen from the dust. He will invite her and all of us, of course, invites all of us to, do, to follow him and to also arise from the dust. And we'll talk more about that scene toward the end and also this theme of what arise from the dust means. And I hope you'll consider the role of that term or concept in the scriptures a little, more, a little differently from now on. Uh, for dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. Dust has been a theme of, of creation, but also a symbol of death and decay as things degrade and oxidize, return to their original state. The soil, the earth, the dirt, this is the stuff of creation. Plants depend on it for their life. And in fact, it is not just the tool of creation on this earth. We know that our earth and our cosmos is made from the dust of stars. The images that are being, I would say, revealed through the Hubble telescope and other, other forms of uh, telescopy have helped us understand so much more about our universe and our, or, and our origins and the dust from which we are made. We are the stuff of stars. This theme of dust is an ancient motif. Rising from the dust in the Book of Mormon and in the Bible has a lot of meaning, a lot of context. Of course, it's the beginning of creation, the end of mortality, and modern Bible scholarship has also added something I think fairly new to our understanding in this area, that rising from the dust is rich with covenant themes. It is a covenant symbol, and if you miss that symbol, it has both political and spiritual implications. If you miss that, you might miss some of the content that we have in the scriptures. So by understanding this complex of dust-related themes, we can solve some puzzles in, this, in our Book of Mormon and other parts of the scriptures and gain added insight. The theme of dust is not just something that you find in the Near East, but also in the, in the Far East. In China, for example, we have the five elements, wood, fire, water, metal, and earth. And what's interesting is that earth in this uh, Chinese view of, of, of cosmology has the, is associated with the color yellow, which is also the color of the emperor. It's a color of enthronement. And we also see that the associated animal is the human, and the cardinal direction is not east, north, south, or west, but the center. It is at the center as if it were the axis mundi, the axis that connects heaven, earth, and the underworld together, all linked to the earth, with a symbol that has the ground and an axis rising out from it. The, yellow, the, the, the color yellow is very likely due to the fact that in China, dust is typically yellow. The rich yellow dirt from the western, northwestern plains, northern plains of China is the source of this great yellow colored silt that fills the yellow river and also colors the yellow sea. And when there are dust storms, they are fearsome yellow dust storms. 
Dust here is a symbol of chaos, as it also is in the Near East. Can be a symbol of chaos. This investigation into themes of dust was sparked by, uh, by Noel Reynolds. Is Noel here today? I see. He was here yesterday. Um, Noel Reynolds did a very interesting paper a number of years ago called The Brass Plates Version of Genesis. And in this paper, he explored interesting connections between the Book of Moses and the Book of Mormon. And he found numerous terms that were common to both, but not in the King James Bible, and they were used in a way in the Book of Mormon that suggested, in many cases, a one-way dependency, that the Book of Mor Moses was the source for terms in the Book of Mormon, which is very interesting because the translation for the Book of Moses came after the Book of Mormon was complete. And that suggested to him that the Book of Moses may have had material, may contain material, that was also available on the brass plates that Nephi used and Alma and others used heavily in the, preparing the Book of Mormon. I was uh, intrigued by his study and I also became curious about a striking image in our Book of Moses and wondered if it was related to the Book of Mormon. This is the image of great chains of darkness, or chains of darkness in Moses chapter 7. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, this study resulted in three papers that got published, parts 1, 2, and 3 at the interpreter. And for your convenience, I'll refer you to a few additional sources using shortcuts at tinyurl.com. And so what you do is you go to tinyurl.com slash arise dust one is the first paper, two is the second, three is the third paper, and I have like 15 or 16 different sources, so Arise Dust 1 through about 18 will get you different papers related to uh, today's presentation if you want to dig into some of these topics. I'll just give you a quick glance at a part of what Noel, Noel Reynolds came up with in his work. Um, this is from what he called Group 1. These are concepts that are not found in the King James Bible, but are common to both the Book of Mormon and the, uh, the book, uh, book of Moses. And these are groups of words, things like the combination of transgression, fall, fall, and death in a, in a single verse, um, or order, days, years, eternity. He has some very interesting finds, and some of them are really intriguing, and I think his work deserves a lot more attention personally. So, intrigued by this, I began to wonder, could there be more parallels? And at this time, I was working on a paper for Mormon Interpreter responding to a a, um, a, a, somebody's objections to Lehi's trail in the Book of Mormon. And the paper ended up being Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, which is Arise Dust 8 on tinyurl.com, where one of the verses I considered there in responding to some of the criticisms regarding the Exodus theme in the Book of Mormon was 1 Nephi 4.2. And as I was pondering 1 Nephi 4.2, I puzzled over a particular wording there. Nephi tells his brethren, let us go up let us be strong like unto Moses. And he speaks this to Laman and Lemuel as if they would know this concept, Moses, strong. But I didn't have that image in my mind. In fact, as you see in the painting here, I'm thinking of the battle, the battle against the Amalekites, the battle of Rephidim, Rephidim where uh, Moses has to hold up a staff. And when the, when the staff is up, Joshua and the troops prevail. And when it's down, they don't. So he's got to hold up this staff. And it may be five pounds, three pounds. I don't know. But he needs, I know it's a long time. It's tiring. But it takes two men to help him hold this up. To me, that's not a picture of, of uh, remarkable strength. And as I searched through the Old Testament, I found out the Old Testament uses that word strength to, to describe Pharaoh, to describe the waters, to describe Joshua, but never Moses. So where did Nephi have this concept of strength? Then I turned to the book of Moses. Right away, Moses 1 found three verses, two of them talking about the Lord giving strength to Moses, and the third one I thought was most impressive, blessed art thou, Moses, this is verse 25, for I, the Almighty, have chosen thee, and thou shalt be made stronger than many waters. And that suggested to me this could be another one of these parallels to go with Noel Reynolds' work. Could there be more? Um, Reynolds had used computer searching to look for exact phrases. I started looking at some of the concepts in the Book of Moses, comparing them to concepts in the Book of Mormon, and found other possibilities that might arise. The next one I found came by this vivid imagery of chains in the Book of Moses. Uh, one verse, Moses 7:26, he beheld Satan, and he had a great chain in his hand, and it veiled the whole earth with darkness. A chain that veils the earth with darkness. That's a vivid image. And then the remainder were reserved in chains of darkness until judgment of the great day. Now these terms, uh, the chains of darkness are also found in the, in the New Testament, 2 Peter 2, 4 and Jude verse 6, which uh, many scholars believe may derive from the book of Enoch, which Jude also mentions. Uh, first Enoch wasn't found until 1912, but 
refers to uh, great iron chains that bound spirits in prison. And that could be the concept where this, this comes from, and it's uh, interesting that it's in the book of Moses. But, when I looked in, but it's not in the Old Testament, and it would not, have be, not be expected to be on the brass plates um, based on the, you know, the Old Testament that we have. But I looked for parallels in the Book of Mormon, and at first, well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you this in the next slide, when I began searching, I didn't find the phrase chains of darkness at all in the Book of Mormon. But I did find 2 Nephi 1.23 linking obscurity with chains in Lehi's farewell speech. And the Webster 1828 dictionary defines obscurity, the first definition it gives is darkness. And I thought, hmm, chains and obscurity or darkness, that could be a link. And then I would find by looking at verses, by looking at other verses and other passages, I found quite a few more links between chains and darkness or cha Satan's chains in the Book of Mormon. What was interesting though about 2 Nephi 123 is that when I used my Blue Letter Bible app and looked up the Hebrew words for chains and darkness, um, I found there could be a plausible Hebrew wordplay going on. Uh, in 2 Nephi 123, chains and, uh, and obscurity are in, uh, are, excuse me, darkness and dust are in parallel, and the words, the word com most commonly used in the Old Testament, afar, for, for dust, is a possible wordplay with the Hebrew word awful for obscurity. And I'll show you more about that on the next slide. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, this is, oh, excuse me, I've got the, I've, uh, let me first show you some of the additional connections that were, were, that were found in the, uh, in the search for links between Book of Moses and the Book of Mormon. So you have Strength of Moses, Chains of Darkness, and the, many of these details we're not going to talk about today. They are in the paper, uh, especially uh, that, that number one, Arise Dust One at tinyurl.com. Uh, but some of them are quite interesting. One of them is the, the idea, for example, of the word returning void. And it's in the, specifically in the context of the Garden of Eden and the Fall, or esteeming Scripture as a thing of naught. And those are found in both of those, both Book of Moses, Book of Mormon. But this wordplay um, intrigued me. Isaiah 29.4 talks about speech whispering from the dust, and it uses afar. There's also a related uh, root, affair, uh, using the aleph instead of ayin as the first letter, but they're, they're both related, and, and scholars have noted a number of ways how these words really come from the same ultimate concept. It's usually translated as ashes, but it can be translated as dust. It is twice in the NIV. And then the KGV word for obscurity uh, can be transliterated as ophel, and it means darkness, obscurity. And those are possible words that, both coming from Isaiah also, that could have been brought together by Lehi in a wordplay as he teaches his sons something really important. And he's drawing upon Isaiah 52, one to two, in his teachings in the farewell speech. So let me just show these to you. Uh, awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments. And then, uh, O Jerusalem, in verse two, shake thyself from the dust. There's this cleansing going on. Arise and sit down. I put sit down in red because it's puzzling. O Jerusalem, loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Sit down, you wonder, wait, if you're coming out of the dust, why would you sit back down in it? But the concept of sitting down or being seated here is not to sit back down on the ground, but to sit on your throne. This is a reference to receiving um, a role, a position, power, empowerment, enthronement. So arise and be seated on your throne, not back in the dust. This is part of the uh, very glorious message in Isaiah 52. Look how Lehi employs it in Isaiah 50, in, in uh, 2 Nephi 1. He tells his sons, he's speaking especially to his wicked sons, I would that you would awake, awake, and shake off the awful chains. So we now have shaking off dust, we're shaking off chains, they're all part of those bands you have to free yourself from. Awake and arise from the dust. He himself is going to return to the dust, but he tells his sons in verse 21, arise from the dust, my sons, and be men, that you may not come down into captivity, that you may not be cursed with a sore cursing. Awake, my sons, put on the armor of righteousness, shake off the chains with which ye are bound, and come forth out of obscurity and arise from the dust. There is obscurity, darkness, and chains together in that verse, connected to the book of Moses, but connected to Isaiah 52 in a beautiful, poetic way. In fact, Oh, and here's just, to, just to remind you, there's the verse in Isaiah 52 where you can see how, how those verses are used so well. It's so poetic that it actually fits into a beautiful chiasmus. 
And if you go to the Arise Dust 7 um, URL, you can download Donald R. Donald R. Donald R. Perry's fabulous poetic parallelisms in the Book of Mormon, where he has reformatted the Book of Mormon to help highlight uh, the chiasmic structure that often occurs or other forms of parallelism. And here I'm largely following his structure with a slight difference in, in how I do the central part. But awake, sleep, uh, sleep of hell, chains are uh, the, the, the first one, A, and also the second A, awake, chains, and obscurity. And it really is a very crisp, beautiful, concise chiasmus. Seven steps, deliberate, dictated by Joseph Smith on the fly, out of a hat, bringing all these ancient concepts together and put, topping it off by putting it into uh, a beautiful example of parallelism, of poetry. This passage, Isaiah 55, 1 to 2, is quoted entirely twice in the Book of Mormon by, by Jacob uh, in 2 Nephi 8 and by Christ in 3 Nephi 20. It's directly used or paraphrased by, by, paraphrased by Lehi in his farewell in 2 Nephi 1, uh, by Moroni in his farewell in Moroni 1031. And it's alluded to in multiple other places, Jacob 3, Alma 5, Alma 36, the great chiasmus. In fact, uh, many of the occurrences of the word chains in the Book of Mormon you find inside of poetry of chiasmus and a couple of others. This concept of dust and enthronement was most clearly brought out in 1972 by a scholar who's still very active, a great writer and pastor, uh, Walter Brueggemann, and his article from Dust to Kingship, Kingship in the Zeitschrift, Zeitschrift für die Alttestamentliche Wissenschaft in 1972 is a, a fascinating article, not so easy to get online. He explains that the motifs of covenant renewal, enthronement, and resurrection cannot be kept in isolation from each other. These are all intertwined. And he explains that rising from the dust is related to enthronement and empowerment. And it has both spiritual and political implications, which is really fascinating. His investigation began with 1 Kings 16.2, where the Lord tells King Basha of Israel, I exalted you out of the dust and made you leader over my, my people, but then now I'm going to utterly sweep you away. And that's, for, that's language from the American Standard Version uh, that, that Brueggemann was using, which is referring to Basha losing his status and becoming dust again. So you gain, to rise from the dust, you gain political status. When you're kicked out, you're back to the dust, political. But it also is tied to the creation. Of course, God formed man out of the dust. We are all dust and we'll return to it. Interestingly, after being formed from the dust, Adam and Eve are given a, a task. They're, given, they're put in charge of the garden and its maintenance. This is an aspect of being given authority and responsibility, which is associated with this whole theme of arising from the dust. Brueggemann also says that behind the creation formula, formula lies a royal formula of enthronement to be, to, to be Taken from the dust is to be elevated out of obscurity into royal office. To return to the dust is to be kicked out, of, removed from that office and to return to obscurity. And that word obscurity is nicely, nicely fits uh, Lehi's farewell speech. To be taken from the dust also means to be accepted as a covenant partner and, and treated graciously. To fall, return to the dust, you're out of that covenant relationship. To die and be raised is to be out of covenant and then back in covenant. And he's basing this on quite a few different scriptures. Also, 1 Samuel 2.8 is a very important one in his analysis. He builds his work on previous work of J. Vingard's, who published in Vetus Testamentum in 1967, and there's a, oh, there's a, the Arise Dust 10 will take you to that source. He points out that dying and rising uh, describe the voiding and renewing of covenants. This is maybe the key point. Themes related to dust are associated with covenants and covenant keeping in, the, in, the, in this ancient motif. And this was not well known when Joseph Smith was dictating this. Calls to turn or repent involve changing loyalties or entering into a new covenant. And also he points out that the New Testament themes of resurrection are built on Israel's ancient enthronement rituals. And when Christ was raised up from the dead on the third day, that concept draws upon a variety of Old Testament motifs, especially Hosea 6.2, it was a subject of his, of his study, where we have um, three days in the grave followed by revival. That concept, three days in the grave followed by revival, is an important one we'll see in the Chiasmus in Alma 36. Lehi employs the dust and creation motifs very well in 2 Nephi 1. He talks about awaking and arising dust, 
cursing, as in the Garden of Eden, the, the ground being cursed for their sake. Light and dark, creation, which is the opposite of destruction. Agency versus captivity. And those are just a few passages he tells his sons to awake from a deep sleep, like Adam awaking from his deep sleep. Coming out of obscurity, like coming out of the void in Genesis 1. Being cut off from God's presence, like being cast out and cut off from God's presence in the Garden of Eden. The cursing, being clothed with skins, uh, similar to putting on the armor of righteousness or robes of righteousness. And now the political aspects. Second Nephi 1 has political implications. A very important issue for the Nephite nation was who was the rightful successor to Lehi? Who had the right authority? The older brothers or this younger upstart, Nephi? David Bakavoy, in light of Walter Brueggemann's work, um, talked about the political implications of the dust theme in both Nephi and, Jake, and Jacob's writings and sermons. Lehi's charge to rise from the dust and keep the covenant is accepted by Nephi implicitly when he says in his great psalm, just a couple chapters later, 2 Nephi 4.28, Awake, my soul, no longer droop in sin. Rejoice, O my heart, and give place no more for the enemy of my soul. He also prays that he may shake at the appearance of sin. And that shaking, to shake off the dust, is part of Lehi's uh, shaking off the chains or bands. It's part of what Lehi and Isaiah teach. This strengthens the case for Nephi as the legitimate successor of Lehi, both politically and spiritually. Two chapters later, Jacob, at Nephi's explicit request, quotes Isaiah 52, 1 to 2. And in, in context, Bakavoy says this really cements that Lehi was applying this for its enthronement aspects, so that he was the rightful king and heir, ruler. He who rises from the dust is given authority and power, and it is Nephi who takes that challenge and follows Lehi's commands to rise from the dust, repent, and follow the Savior. Laman and Lemuel could reign, according to Lehi, if they would rise from the dust and be men, but that honor goes to Nephi. Bakavoy's article, Arise Dust 5 at tinyurl.com. So, Nephi gives this significant emphasis using, and we understand that emphasis as we apply the dust theme to, to resolve a puzzle that happens when you look at dust in the Book of Mormon. One of the, the puzzle is this, Isaiah 49, 22 to 23, it's quoted twice by Nephi in short order. Two occurrences, 1 Nephi 21 and 2 Nephi 6. This is that famous verse where the Lord talks about the Gentiles, they'll be a standard to my people, they'll bring forth his sons and daughters, and kings will be thy nursing fathers, queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth. They're, they're stepping down from their thrones, their face in the earth, showing they're giving up their authority, or losing their authority, or at least showing great humility. And instead of being on the throne, they're now licking up the dust of the feet of gathered Israel as they come back. This is a scene that you might call an ironic enthronement scene, where the vagabonds come in and they get the dust licked off their feet by the former kings and queens. This passage um, that's quoted twice, why would it be quoted twice? I would twice, I propose that it's part of a large inclusio to highlight Lehi's dust-related speech as a key passage in Nephite religion. Inclusio is, of course, an ancient poetical device in which a common phrase or material is used as a bracket around content in between. Chiasmus can be thought of as recursive bracket. Bracket, 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 bracket. So it's, a, it's an important form of parallelism that can be used in a variety of creative ways. Here's Nephi's dusty inclusio. Uh, the first section, what I would call the bracket, is actually a passage that, that begins with a washing or a dust removal scene, 1 Nephi 20, which is quoting Isaiah 48.1, arising from the waters of Judah or baptism, and it ends with 1 Nephi 21, 22 to 26, which is quoting that passage about kings licking the dust off the feet of the covenant people. Then comes the bracketed interior, which is 1 Nephi 22 and 2 Nephi 1 to 6. This includes Lehi's farewell and Nephi's psalm that responds to Lehi's farewell. And 2 Nephi 2 and 3 also have many relationships to, the, to these concepts. Themes of dust, deliverance from captivity, and redemption are included in this section. Then comes the end bracket. This is again Isaiah on dust removal and ironic enthronement, the, the bracket parts. Dust removal, ironic enthronement. It begins with 2 Nephi 6.6, 6, which now flipping the order that we had in the first bracket, we begin with the, the licking of dust scene, Isaiah 49 being quoted again. And then it closes uh, a couple chapters later, 2 Nephi 8, 
which, which is Jacob quoting Isaiah 52 at Nephi's request, which brings in the arise from the dust theme very strongly. Someone knew what they were doing in terms of poetical structure and inclusio, and putting that nice chiasmus of Lehi in the center of this inclusio, filled with possible word plays and other allusions to scripture. It is beautiful poetry with a lot of content and covenant-based themes that are right on, right on target, right on tune, based on what modern scholarship is telling us about the ancient use of the dust theme. And there's explanatory power. Why else would Nephi make the same Isaiah passage appear twice in his record when it's so hard to write and limited space on the plates? Why repeat that twice? Making it part of an inclusio highlights and expands upon its meaning and signals the primacy, the significance of this passage, Lehi's theme about rising from the dust and Nephi's response to it. This is a foundation not only of the, the le legitimacy of the Nephite nation, but of Nephi's core message of the, of the key themes that, of the Book of Mormon to help us arise from the dust. It signals that that content is highly important, a vital motif to be pay, paid attention to. Interestingly, dust also begins and ends the, sec, the book of 2 Nephi. 2 Nephi 1 is rich in dust themes from Lehi's farewell speech, but the concluding words of Nephi's second book, I speak unto you as the voice of one crying from the dust, farewell until that great day shall come. Book of Mormon is a voice from the dust from beginning to end. This dust complex of themes includes dust as a symbol of death, decay, chaos, the raw materials of creation, but also rising from the dust as keeping the covenant, resurrection, receiving power and authority, even enthronement, salvation, exaltation. Dust, like chains of captivity, must be shaken off, or it can be washed off or licked off. Related concepts include shaking, shaking of dust, chains, bands, trembling, repenting, cleansing, um, singing. You often break, once, once that dust is off and you rise in the dust, you often break out into songs of joy in the scriptures, rejoicing for those who arise. And the word arise, rising, is uh, kum in, uh, in the Hebrew, which can also mean to establish or stand or ascend. And that adds some interesting concepts uh, that are discussed in a couple of those papers. Sitting in authority, putting on robes of authority, being surrounded by the Lord's arms, encirclement, not only by chains or bands that bind you down, but on the contrast, being encircled by the arms of the Lord's love, as Lehi talks about, or as Alma does in his chiasmus, or the robes of righteousness of the Lord. Um, very strong endowment-related concepts. Resurrection, exaltation, enthronement, they all tie in. Uh, just a quick mention of some of the other uses of Isaiah on dust themes. Isaiah 26, 19, uh, resurrection. The dead men shall uh, live, with my dead body they shall rise awake and sing. There's breaking out into song again, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy do, which can be a symbol of resurrection, refreshment, resurrection, uh, and, the earth, and, and revelation, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Isaiah 61, 3, beautiful verse. Uh, to those that mourn in Zion, they'll, they'll be given beauty instead of ashes or dust. They'll be given oil of joy, like anointing, instead of mourning, and the garment of praise uh, for the spirit of heaviness. So ashes and uh, that ash theme tied in with enthronement again. And Isaiah 29, 4, which I've already mentioned, the speech shall be low out of the dust as one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. Um, excellent resource on this is Avraham Gileadi, the literary message of Isaiah. Um, 1994 and 2012, and look at especially in his sections where he talks about chaos and creation. And he gives very strong evidence, by the way, for the literary unity of, of, the, book of, uh, of, of the book of Isaiah. And that began by noting Isaiah 52 and 53 are so parallel to Isaiah 13 and 14. This rising from the dust theme is in opposition poetic opposition to the king of Babylon and his fall, or Satan and his fall, in Isaiah 13 and 14. He realized something is going on there between those two halves of Isaiah, and that led him to explore further and find very, I consider, very strong evidence for the unity of Isaiah, which also helps resolve some Book of Mormon questions. This theme of dust removal needs to be considered also. A washing of the feet, a powerful image. Here's the Savior washing the feet off of his disciples. What does that mean? Sacred ordinance. Like rising from the dust, this is a washing to remove dust, but it's also a symbol of cleansing but, and of receiving authority or honor. Licking the dust off the feet in Isaiah 49, 23 should be considered in that context. Related is the idea of uh, anointing the eyes with clay in John 9, where we have a blind man, Christ anoints his eyes with clay and spittle. And Irenaeus suggested that this was 
clay being used as a symbol of dust for God's creative work. Uh, some authorities have disagreed with that over the, over the centuries until Dead Sea Scrolls came out showing ancient Jews using dust as, or using clay in the same way as dust, as a symbol of creation and God's creative work. If so, if we look at Enoch in the book of Moses, he became a seer when the Lord told him to took some clay and anoint his eyes, wash it off, then he could see things that no man could see before. And we see this theme, washing off of dust or clay, like sin or chaos, leads to receiving divine gifts. Becoming a seer, royalty, enthronement, power, is dust removal an aspect of baptism that one should consider as one rises from the waters of chaos and death? I would suggest perhaps, I think so. Uh, starting to look at dust themes then elsewhere in the Book of Mormon, we run into dust in the beginning of King, King Benjamin's famous speech where he tells his hearers that I'm, you're no more than the dust of the earth and I myself am dust. So dust, uh, two references at the beginning, actually three, uh, then at the end, after they've heard his speech, they fall into the earth and they're ready to make a covenant. They view themselves as less than the dust of the earth. And they cry aloud, all with one voice, oh, have mercy and apply the atoning blood of Christ. The dust theme is about bringing us to Christ. To arise from the dust is tied intimately to the role of the Savior and our redemption. Is this swooning of the Nephites? So they all fall to the earth at once and they all yell these words out to the ones? This looks like a ritual performance, a ritual act. Is this a ritualized response to spiritual events in Nephite culture influenced by the significance of this rise from the dust theme that Nephi and Lehi have introduced the Nephite religion? This may be part of what motivates people to fall to the dust so often in the Book of Mormon. Falling to the earth has a number of possible meanings. It can re represent physical death, spiritual death, rebellion, sin, breaking the covenant, losing power, authority, life, and on the opposite, on the flip side, uh, you have rising, standing, which can also be symbolic of resurrection, revival, entering into a covenant, keeping the covenant, receiving authority and enthronement. With that in mind, Abinadi's encounter with Noah's priest is another puzzle in the Book of Mormon where I think understanding Isaiah 52 and the Nephite complex of dust themes helps us understand a puzzle. To me, one of the big puzzles in the Book of Mormon had long been the scene. Out of all the, so these, these priests, they're out to get Abinadi killed. He's a thorn in their side. They want to rebut him, refute him, reject his words. Out of all the tricky questions they could use to entrap him, why would they pick this one? They throw Isaiah 52 out at him and say, what does this mean, the scriptures that say how beautiful upon the mountains are the, are the feet? And here's the, the passage that they throw at him. Upon the feet of him that bringeth good, good tidings, that publisheth peace, is this nice feel-good part of Isaiah 52. And I always wondered why they threw that question at him. Here's a proposal. If Isaiah 52 were a foundational part of Nephite religion and culture, as suggested by Nephite's Dusty Inclusio and Lehi's farewell speech, then it would make sense that they would be very familiar with Isaiah 52, and they might be focusing on the feel-good part of Isaiah 52, the part about, hey, let's rejoice, let's feel good, it's peace, everything's great, redeemed, comforted, salvation. It's all good, feel-good stuff. And then you're bringing us this doom and gloom message. How do these two sink? And they're challenging his doom and gloom message by quoting the basic scripture of the Nephite religion, perhaps. Abinadi's response to me is even more puzzling because he doesn't just come back and explain why they're wrong right away and give a nice concise answer. He goes on for chapters and it seems like a long rambling response before he ever gets back to the main question. But in light of the significance of Isaiah 52 and its misapplication by these priests, you, we can see that his response really lays a brilliant foundation to help others that might be listening in and anyone that might be paying attention, like young Alma over there, to understand what Isaiah 52 really means. It, because you don't get the benefits of grace without entering into the covenant and accepting the covenant and knowing who the Messiah is. So he teaches the law and its purpose. He teaches reconciliation through the Messiah and he teaches then repentance and following God. Only then can the rejoicing begin. And so he comes around full circle after quoting Isaiah 53 and teaching about the Messiah and repenting and rising, receiving grace and putting on the beautiful garments of the Lord. Only then can we receive that grace and, and enter into Mount Zion singing praises with our feet firmly established. Then our feet are truly beautiful and in the presence of the Lord. But there's, there's work to be done before that happens. 
Another puzzle is Alma 36. And we, almost everyone here is probably familiar with Alma 36, how beautiful it is, this intricate chiasmus. But there are some weak spots in it where several verses become just one keyword in the, in, when, in the middle. There's some places that look kind of loose in the middle. Starts off very concise, the middle's really concise, A, B, C, A, B, C, it's really clear, and then it gets loose. And critics have said, that's ah, not really a chiasmus. You just picked one word out of 150 and called that, you know, why would you pick that one word? Well, there's, in uh, paper three that I talked about, we look at this in light of uh, n multiple aspects of the rise and the death theme. I'll just mention one today, the significance of falling to the earth as a sign of covenant breaking and death in contrast to arising and regaining life. If you consider that, look at that sloppy portion, verses 7 to 11, normally gets just one or two uh, keyword hits, but there's a lot more going on here when you start thinking about the rise and the dust theme. The earth trembled beneath their feet. They fell to the earth. They have fear of the Lord. The voice says, arise, and I arose. Hey, there's that arise, arise thing going on. Is that related? They're, he's, they're threatened with destruction twice. He again mentions, I fell to the earth, and he was three days and three nights. And then their threat to be destroyed. You might be destroyed. Fear, destroyed. They fell to the earth, did hear no more. In this passage, falling to the earth is mentioned three times. And if falling to the earth is significant in light of Isaiah 52 and Lehi's farewell speech, we also might consider the, the mention of three days in the grave, which fits into this dust theme, a symbol of death but also of resurrection, as being related to this. When we consider that and apply it to Alma 36, well, we see some interesting things going on. Um, when you look on the other side, the other side has another loose section too. There's a loose section here that had falling to the earth three times. There's a loose section on the other side of the chiasmus, which has in opposition being born again three times. What better contrast to falling to the earth than being born again, to arise from the dust and be born again? That is the ultimate Book of Mormon theme, calling us to come into the Messiah, arise from the dust, and be born again through his grace. And that's what's being taught here. And we have these dust themes. He sees God on his throne. There's enthronement. There's singing going on. His limbs receive their strength. Instead of being dead, now he's coming alive in contrast to the death symbol. He's now born of God, and he has exceeding joy. He mentions again that he helps others to be born of God and filled with the Holy Ghost. And then in verse 26, again, many have been born of God. Born of God three times. Times, falling to the earth three times, there's some kind of parallelism going here. And actually, there are multiple strands of these additional themes related to dust that are adding to the compactness of the parallelism in this chiasmus that doesn't all fit in a nice linear array, but shows there's a lot of poetry going on that maybe we've been overlooking. So some implications for Alma 36, those loose sections might have more going on than we imagined before. Uh, falling to the earth needs to be contrasted with um, being born again. And also we have at the very pivot of this, of this beautiful chiasmus where he turns to Christ, he also makes a reference to being, being encircled by the chains of hell. And that encirclement with the chains of hell is now contrasted with the light that he sees as soon as he calls upon the name of Christ. These are chains of darkness, they're chains of hell, in contrast to the light that, and liberation that God brings. And it's artfully woven in there. And there may even be a wordplay going on between encircling and, in, and atonement, uh, kathar and kafar going, uh, in Alma 36. Uh, that paper, uh, Rise Dust 3, gets into that in more detail. Christ's use of, arise, of, the, of the arise from the dust theme in 3 Nephi 20 is really beautiful. In context, this is occurring right after the amazing miracles in 3 Nephi 19, one of the most beautiful parts of the Book of Mormon, where they've had this covenant scene, baptism, receiving the Holy Ghost, angels descending, a marvelous uh, scene where, where Christ has given them the sacrament and um, wonderful things have happened. And now in this chapter, 3, 3 Nephi 20, there's another covenant scene. He continues and he gives them, in this scene he gives them the sacrament, but it's miraculously provided by pure grace. The bread and wine are provided from, from, from nothing, it would seem. And he continues this covenant theme, but before he does that sacrament, he commands them to arise, and they arose up and stood. They have fallen to the earth. Another Nephite scene, they've all fallen to the earth. So great was the spiritual impact of third Nephi 19. Now he commands them to arise. They're arising from the dust. Arise, arise. They stood. And now he begins speaking of covenants. This is 
a key aspect. Rise from the dust is related to covenants. And he teaches fulfilling the covenant, spends verse after verse talking about the covenants and how he will also establish my people. There's that word establish, which can mean arise, same Hebrew word, kum. Um, I'll establish this people, establish in this land, and a prophet shall God raise up. All may have been used in the Hebrew word kum that Isaiah uses for arise. And the Father, having raised me up unto you first, to turn sinners away from renewing from, from iniquities. This is a renewal of the covenant scene. And then break forth into joy, sing together, awake, awake again, and put on thy strength. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise, sit down. Quoting Isaiah 52. Right on key. It's a beautiful, poetic majestic scene with miracles taking place and, 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 and entwined with the arise from the dust theme and how beautiful upon the feet is again mentioned how beautiful his feet were washed by the tears of the Nephites as they greeted him as their Savior and Lord concepts of restoration gathering fulfilling the covenant continue in that chapter Moroni's third and final closing there's so much to be said about this would be a whole couple hour talk, uh, Moroni's closings, his three closings. Grant Hardy's done a marvelous job elucidating this and, and many other good papers are on this topic. His final closing in Moroni 10 applies Isaiah 52. Awake and arise from the dust, O Jerusalem. Put on thy beautiful garments, O daughter of Zion. Strengthen thy stakes and enlarge thy borders forever, that thou mayest no more be confounded, that the covenants of the eternal Father, which, which he hath made unto thee, O house of Israel, may be fulfilled. Moroni closes the voice from the dust by linking dust and arising from the dust to the covenants of the Father, as Lehi did, as Christ did. And now, as modern scholars recognize, is an appropriate way to apply this theme. Try this one more time. It wants to, uh, it doesn't want to advance. It wants to bring me, yeah, if you just move it forward, a click or two. There we go. And maybe a couple more. Uh, come unto Christ and be perfected unto him. The arise from the dust theme, again, always, it's about bringing us unto Christ. The grace of Christ. And Brad Wilcox did such a great job yesterday explaining this grace of Christ that doesn't just get us past the finish line. It helps us follow him and move toward being more like him, to become perfect in Christ, to be sanctified in Christ through the power of this covenant of the Father unto the remission of your sins, that you become holy without spot. This is the goal of Christ. This is what he beckons us to do. And he looks forward to having his spirit and body again reunite, that he might too stand from the dust and join us. These themes from the rise from the dust theme are beautifully, poetically brought out here. So some tentative conclusions. A complex of dust themes in the Book of Mormon are appropriately, is appropriately and meaningfully applied. Modern scholarship on this ancient theme gives us tools to better understand rich and subtle meanings, such as what Nephi and Lehi were doing in, in their passages, or further relationships to the Book of Moses and the Brass Plates, better understanding the trouble spots in Alma 36 that may actually be strengths instead of weaknesses, better understanding Abinadi versus King Noah's preach, or King Benjamin's speech and the habit of Nephite swooning, and the covenant-based objectives of Christ and Moroni. Isaiah 52 may have been pivotal in Nephite religion, as exemplified by that dusty inclusio and the chiasmus that are used to, to emphasize it. Those themes are artfully and beautifully used with, with inclusio, with chiasmus, with word plays, and appropriate covenant-based implications. And this was all done by Joseph Smith dictated out of a hat. This is important evidence for the significance of the Book of Mormon as an ancient not 19th century, but an ancient voice from the dust. Its goal is to help us rise from the dust and follow the Savior. And so I return to that original scene. Mary standing before the evidence of the greatest event in world history, the atonement, the resurrection of Christ, the empty tomb. She sees, but initially misunderstands, this powerful evidence before her. And we can make an analogy to us as we encounter the Book of Mormon. She saw this evidence, but perceived it as, hey, something's gone wrong here. The body's been stolen. A crime, maybe, has been committed. She hears a gardener calling to her and does not recognize his voice at first and thinks, maybe this is the guy who's the problem. Maybe there's some kind of malfeasance going on. Some kind of fraud has occurred. What have you done with the body, she wonders. She mistakes this powerful evidence as a possible crime or act of fraud. 
And it's only when she listens again, when he calls her again, and pays more attention to that voice from the dust, newly arisen from the dust, that she's able to recognize something more, to hear a familiar voice, like a familiar spirit, freshly risen from the dust. The Book of Mormon calls to us, and it's the voice of the Savior calling to us through the Book of Mormon. Do we hear that voice, or do we mistake it as fraud? Do we think of it as, oh, this is just garden-style 19th century religious fiction? Or do we recognize that that's not just a garden variety book? That gardener is the Messiah, risen from the dust, asking us to follow him and also arise from the dust in a covenant relationship where we'll be washed, cleansed, and, ro and given robes of righteousness and encircled, not with chains of darkness or chains of hell, but with the loving arms of the Savior and robes of righteousness in their presence forever. That is the power and majesty of the Book of Mormon, and I pray that we can better appreciate it and its magnificence. And thank you for listening, I, and I, I offer these words in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. What are your thoughts on the symbol of the apostles being, uh, being charged to shake off the dust of their feet when they are not received? So dust can, be a, can also be used as a symbol of cursing. And it could be a, you know, a symbol of, I am, you know, I'm, I'm unhappy with you. Uh, shaking off the dust is not a terribly polite thing to do. And yeah, it does, have, it does have implications. People are rejecting the covenant, not willing to accept the covenant. Uh, you shake off the dust as, as a sign or symbol, and it should be taken by them, uh, hopefully not as an insult, but as a call to repent, and they need to rise from the dust. So that's one way of looking at it. Uh, why would your proposal, in, uh, why would your proposed inclusio span the books of First and Second Nephi? Yeah, this is a great question. Nephi is the author of the first two books of Nephi. Why he split them where he did is a very interesting question. It's beyond the topic for today, but I'll, I can suggest one thing. Uh, well, Noah Reynolds has written also in, in his article, Nephi's Outline. I recommend that as a way of understanding what he's doing in 1st Nephi. But there's also some very interesting parallelism between 2nd Nephi and 1st Nephi, which makes a poetical and appropriate way for splitting that work into two. You can think of first, there's Nephi, for example, 1st Nephi 1, Nephi, Lehi has this vision of God and gets his kind of call to be a prophet, and in 2 Nephi 1 is also the foundation for Lehi's, or for, ne for, excuse me, for Nephi's role as prophet, and is related to his own commission of a prophet that takes place over a couple of chapters. There are some interesting reasons. I do address some of those in the, in the, uh, the first article. Um, I would suggest Noel Reynolds' uh, work can also help expand that, but Nephi keeps developing some themes across both books. There's no reason he wants to break off his message. He still has some integrated messages on both halves. And there's a second, okay. Um, you mentioned grace as a benefit of covenant making. Is grace also available to those who have not made the covenant? Um, grace is extended to us in many ways. The fact, that we will, the fact that we are here alive is through the grace of the Messiah. The fact that we will all be resurrected one day is certainly an act of grace. And grace is being offered to us continually to give us power to move toward the Savior. So people that are not in the covenant can receive all sorts of blessings, miracles, uh, spiritual witnesses through the grace of Christ. His goal, though, is to help us enter into covenant relationships. That's where the power of grace really comes out. Have you considered Kimura as being uh, derived from Kumura, arise, shine? I have seen that. I think there is, um, uh, that's, that's beyond me. I would suggest looking at the uh, Book of Mormon Onomasticon for some details. It does discuss uh, this as a possibility, but offers some alternatives. I th but it is, uh, it is one that is debatable, is can, can be considered. Is there a connection to Adam being formed? Is there a connection to Adam being formed from the dust? Uh, yes. Yes, he is. The word itself relates to dust or earth, uh, well, to the earth. And we are all formed from the dust, and we follow uh, Adam. You go to the temple, you, re you recognize our connection to Adam. So I mean, I think your question probably has some deeper things to it that I'm missing, but I would be happy to talk about it later. Uh, can you take Clayton Christensen in a one-on-one -on -one game of basketball? <laughs> Well, as a matter of fact, on any given day, 
I could take any NFL player on in the game of basketball. Now, I define any given day as a day when they are sick or in prison. So, uh, and I don't think I would beat Clayton Christensen. I'm sorry, I'm really a bad shot. In all seriousness, what resources would you suggest to those unfamiliar uh, with, but who would like to better understand the literary devices found in the scriptures? Uh, this is a great one. Uh, the download I mentioned, I think it was Arise Dust 7 for uh, Donald Perry's uh, book on the parallelism of the Book of Mormon is a really nice place to start. And the work John Welch has done on chiasmus is really, really valuable. Um, there's probably 20 books right back there that if you ask any of the people from the uh, Book of Mormon Central, and Book of Mormon Central, such a great place, go to Book of Mormon Central and just type in parallelism, poetry, you'll get a lot of good stuff. And uh, also in the interpreter, uh, mormoninterpreter.com. Do you have any comments on the connections between being created from the dust and being born again and sanctified in the Book of Moses? Oh, that is a, that is a great one. Um, I... Let's see, what's my excuse? Time, out of time. Um, no, that, 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 is, that is an excellent one. Uh, creation is emphasized in the Book of Moses. Um, the dust theme is not given the same emphasis we see in the Book of Mormon. I think that really develops more fully from Isaiah 52. So I might have to look at that more fully. I don't have a good answer to, to that right now. But thank you. Those were some great questions and appreciate your attention today.